Hello everyone and welcome to Tulsa Bible Church. My name is Dustin Long and I am the family pastor here and I just have a few announcements for you. If you're a guest or first time visitor and you'd love more information about us, well, we would love more information about you. On the back of the seat in front of you, you may notice a QR code. You can scan that and it'll take you directly to our webpage where you can fill out some information. If you prefer, you can still fill out one of our hand manual guest cards and you can drop that into the giving box or you could take that out to the welcome desk in the front. Members, the QR code also has some information that you might find valuable. It has links to our giving and also links to the app for our church calendar. If you look around today, you may notice that many people are dressed up in sports theme wear. Today is the day of the big game, and we just wanted to have a special service today to kind of have a good time, dress up in your favorite team, and just, and just have fun together celebrating this event. Tonight, youth, we have a, a, a watch party for the NFL championship game. It'll start at 5 o'clock. And if you can, just come that and bring $4, and that'll help cover the cost of pizza and drinks. But if you can't bring $4, that's fine. Just show up, and we're going to play games and have a great time together. The Reality Conference is coming up here in a couple weeks. It's February 24th and 25th. And this is a great event for learning how to defend your faith. And we've called it a youth conference, but it actually would be great for the whole family. So if you want to come and bring your younger children, bring your youth, or even if you're an adult and you think that you would love to hear more about how to defend your faith, then this conference would be great for you. We are so glad you're here today, and if you're Derek, go Eagles, but if you're everybody else, go Chiefs. If you have your Bibles again, turn to Exodus chapter 2. Well, welcome to TBC on Super Bowl Sunday, and this is the one week that we get to answer a lot of questions that we typically don't get to answer during the uh, Sundays that transpired during the year 52. There's, there's one here that's pretty special, and so... All of us today are going to answer some really key questions, especially for football fans. The, the number one question that we're answering is, who is the best team in the NFL in the 2022-23 season? Tonight, we'll determine who that best team is. Another question everybody has, is it going to be the um, Alabama turned OU Oklahoma graduate, or is it going to be this guy from the Red Raiders of Texas Tech? Who's going to lead their team to the championship? Is Andy Reid going to take on his old team in Philly and get the victory over them? Uh, tonight we'll answer all those questions, but there's really one question that tonight's going to answer that's a little bit more significant, a little deeper, and a little bit probably more on the front of your minds than any other of those questions that we're going to answer. That one question is this. Tonight we might find out, is Aaron Rodgers going to play next year for the Green Bay Packers? That's, that's the big question. Okay, seriously, we're not going to answer that question this year, but we are going to answer this question, who's going to win the trophy that's named after the Green Bay Packers coach, Vince Lombardi? We'll, we'll answer that question for sure this, uh, this evening, just pointing out things that we're going to answer. Um, listen, many football fans across the nation could care less about this game. Uh, many non-football fans across the nation, don't even know what time the Super Bowl is on. You know, and, and if that's you in this room this morning, praise God, we love you. Uh, no big deal. One thing you, you're going to see this evening, if you do turn into the game, is you're going to see a lot of brand new commercials in between the timeouts and the quarters and halftime. Uh, you're going to see a lot of new products out there. You're going to see a, a commercial about Jesus, the Super Bowl season. The He Gets Me line is, is going to continue. Uh, you're probably going to see a, a, a commercial designated solely for the gospel and for just inciting a, a maybe an interest. Who is this man, Jesus, that I keep hear about, hearing about? One commercial that, um, that I, I really liked a few years ago, it ran back. Almost the car dealerships almost always run commercials during the Super Bowl and, and Toyota has had some awesome commercials in the past. Not so many years ago, Toyota ran a series of commercials that was designed to reflect uh, if, if you want to be a free person, what you need to do is you need to purchase a Toyota Corolla, and then you can engage in that freedom. And, and there was a song during one of those commercials, you guys know Leslie Gore from the 60s? She sang the song. She was the one, um, she, there's a couple really famous songs that she came out with in the 60s. It goes something like this, and I, I, don't want, I won't sing the whole thing for you, but... Thank you. Uh, I appreciate, yeah. 
There's, there's a reason why I'm not up here uh, before the sermon. You don't own me. Don't try to change me in any way. You guys know this song? You don't own me. Don't try to tell me, tie me down. I'll never stay. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to say. Just let me be myself because I'm free to do what I want. The song is very iconic of the, of the 60s, the anti-authoritarian culture, this, this quest for unrestrained freedom. Just let me be myself. Don't tie me down with any power structures, anybody over me. And I want to mention this morning, because of this postmodern thought, that all of us as, as human beings, we come into this world enslaved. And we need to be freed from these authority structures in the culture and in society. And really, if we want to be who we are truly designed to be, if we want to tap into meaning and, and pleasure and, and enjoy life and get the most out of life, our responsibility is to break forward into this unrestrained freedom apart from those authority structures. It's a, a slavery that many people don't realize is there. It's a, a subtle slavery. It's interesting we're looking at the book of Exodus because Exodus also talks about slavery. There's a, a strong master in Exodus, and then there's a subtle master in Exodus. And this morning in Exodus chapter 2, what I want to do is I want to kind of get past this idea. We, we have Pharaoh, we've got Egypt, we've got this strong master. Israel is, is physically in chains and enslaved to the nation of Egypt. But there's also a, a subtle master underneath all of that. There's also another set of chains. It's, uh, it's much, mo much more covert. It's invisible instead of being visible. It's spiritual. It's not physical. We just started a brand new sermon series through Exodus in a, a very familiar Old Testament story. And we're seeing how an entire people group was enslaved and redeemed from slavery. And when you, you can't read Exodus and not notice these harsh descriptions of the slavery, especially at the beginning parts of this book, Israel was set free from a ruthless taskmaster named Pharaoh. They could see their chains. However, in Exodus chapter 2, you see this, this covert slavery. While there are physical slaves in Egypt, and it was an overt slavery that was visible, there's also a, a covert, invisible slavery in Exodus chapter 2. While the Egyptian slavery was physical, Exodus chapter 2 talks about a slavery that is spiritual. And probably the clearest passage to understand this and understanding sin in all of Scripture goes back to Isaiah 53, verse 6. And it says something like this, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. Each one of us is enslaved to ourselves, to our will, our desires, our ways, our methods, our timing, our longings, our desires. This is the overt slavery that we need to be redeemed from as well. Uh, one man has said that the worst kind of chains are the ones that you can't see. The worst kind of chains are the ones that you can't see. If Exodus 1 was about a strong master, chains that you can see, Exodus 2 is about a subtle master, chains that you can't. And I want to, I want to start with that in Exodus chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 10. Look down at your text, and the first thing we're going to look at here is the example of overcoming a subtle master. You're going to see a, a good illustration as Exodus chapter 2 opens up, and then it's going to move to a not-so-good one. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. It should say this. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and she saw that he was a fine child. Now your translations might say something a little bit different there as it describes Moses. Hang on to that. And she hid him for three months. Verse 3. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. And we know for sure that's Miriam because of other places in the text, okay? And the daughter of Pharaoh came down 
to bathe at the river while her young women were walked beside the river. And she saw that the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, verse 6, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. And she took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister, Miriam, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And so the girl went and called the child's mother. Very significant. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me. I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. D.L. Moody described the life of Moses in three distinct blocks, three definitive blocks of time. And he said this, Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent his second 40 years learning he was nobody. He spent his third 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. And that's really, really true. And where you're going to find a little bit more of that information is is from one of the first martyrs of the faith in Acts chapter 7. Stephen's going to tell the story of Moses' birth and life and getting to the lawgiver of Israel. And he, de- he designates that story into three major sections in Moses' life. You can go back and read it. You're going to find in Acts 7, verse 23, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers. That's when Moses uh, kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. In Acts 7, verse 30, when 40 years had passed from there, an angel appeared to him. That's the burning bush account reveals to him the name of the Lord, calls him to go back to Egypt to redeem his people. And in Acts 7, 36, this man led them out, speaking to Moses, performing wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. We got 120 years of Moses' life being described in Acts chapter 7 that fills in the gaps, a little bit of the details that we don't get here in Exodus, but we have it in the New Testament. It's Stephen who informs us that Moses might have been a little bit prideful in Egypt for at least three reasons. Uh, In Acts, you're going to read about this. It says that he was brought up as a son to Pharaoh in verse 21, Acts chapter 7. He was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians in verse 22. And number three, he was mighty in word and deed. Moses grew up, and he had everything that he could ever want. He had all the resources at his disposal that he could ever want. He had the best education that he he could ever ask for. He had significance, he had security, and he had an identity with the most royal family, the highest up in the strongest nation in the world at that time. And none of those things are inherently wrong unless they're void of humility and brokenness, which seems to be the case for Moses. But before we get to the significant, powerful Moses... I want to talk about the insignificant, uh, marginalized women here in the text, as we're accustomed to see in the book of Exodus. We've got more accounts of women. Immediately after chapter 1, it ended with a decree from Pharaoh. You shall not let any of the Hebrew boys live. You shall send them into the Nile. Immediately after that is the birth story of Moses. So we think that he's going to be one of these Hebrew boys that has to fulfill and succumb to this commandment from Pharaoh. And the text makes deliberate allusions, multiple allusions to Genesis. Okay, so when you look down in your text, uh, verse 2, that first phrase that I talked about when we were reading through here, the woman conceived and bore a son, and she saw that he was a fine child. Literally in Hebrew, it says this, she saw that he was good. And that is a direct allusion to Genesis chapter 1. Remember the creation account? Day 1, God created all those things, and he saw that it was good. There was morning and evening on day 1. Day 2, created, separated, saw that it was good. Day 3, saw that it was good. All these repeated phrases through the Genesis creation account. Then, verse 3, she takes for him a basket. And that word for basket is the same word from Genesis chapter 7 that we see used of Noah's ark. She took and she prepared an ark. The basket is covered with pitch and bitumen, the same way that the ark is described as being covered before the floods came. 
as they sealed up the ark. Why all the references to Genesis? One reference points us to creation, Genesis chapter 1. The other points us to salvation, to deliverance, and also to judgment in Genesis chapter 7. The same God who called Noah is the same God who will call Moses. The same God who created all things is the same God who redeemed through Noah's ark, saved, judged, and delivered all in the same act. He has the right to redeem all things because he created all things. And again, we see this repeated pattern in the Old Testament. That what God has done in the past is a model and a promise of what he will do in the future. Though he is too creative to do the same thing in the same way twice. When an Israelite reads the stories and sees these familiar phrases, they think back to how God has worked in the past. And they have the faith, their, their trust in him is growing, it's building as they read the story of, of the beginning of Moses. Now, let me ask you a question before we go any further. When you read this account of what Miriam did, of what we know that Moses' mother is Jochebed from other passages in Exodus. We know that Reuel uh, is probably a reference to Jethro later on in the book of Moses, same guy, or the book of Exodus, excuse me, same guy. When you read this account of what happened, do you get the impression that Moses' mother, Jochebed, was just kind of throwing caution into the wind and shooting at the hip when she does what she does? Or when you read this account, does it seem like she's got a plan figured out in the back of her mind? Does it seem like she's, she's put this together, that she's found the place where uh, Pharaoh's daughter is going to bathe and she knows exactly where to go? Did she set this thing up perfectly so that Miriam would be maybe on the other side of the river and able to respond when Pharaoh's daughter finds the basket? Doesn't it seem like things are probably coming together when you read this? I, I don't read Exodus chapter 2, and I don't see, okay, God, here's what we're going to do, and we'll just see what happens. When I read Exodus chapter 2, I read about a mother who deeply cares about her son, who is destined for destruction and death. And she cares so much that she puts together and rehearses this plan, and she knows it down to the finest details that she can even talk to her daughter about what to do and what to say, how to act when things happen. That she can set this whole thing up and know that, that maybe, just maybe, if they can execute this plan, they can trust God, he's going to work it out, and maybe Moses will be saved. I conclude when I read Exodus chapter 2 that Jochebed is walking by faith, but she also has a distinct plan in the back of her mind. And that brings up a couple points about what, is it, what does it mean to walk by faith when we read this story? Walking by faith, number one, it doesn't mean that you stop thinking, planning, or praying. Walking by faith doesn't mean you stop thinking, planning, or praying. Some of us have this thought that we're going to just throw caution into the wind. We'll see where the chips fall. We get to Christmas on December 25th, and we haven't budgeted all year, and, and maybe we'll see what happens uh, Christmas time? No. Walking by faith means that you do think, you do pray, and you do have a plan for those times. It means that you're a good steward. A lot of us have an idea of walking by faith that's more along the lines of foolishness than it is along the lines of stewardship, careful planning, and wisdom. It's not faith that the Proverbs calls foolish. Um, it's faith that's profitable. When you presume on God to answer in ways to uh, make up for laziness, perhaps, that's not walking by faith. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and it calls for walking by faith with a plan. Jochebed trusted God, and she acted as she trusted God. She planned as she trusted God. One of my favorite uh, biographies of Moses uh, mentions a there's a, a famous cry during the Revolutionary War when you were lining up for battle across from the British. Trust in God, but keep your powder dry. Trust in God, but keep your powder dry. In other words, don't check your brain at the door. Don't stop planning. Don't stop thinking. Walk with the Lord with wisdom, with careful concern. 
and with the abilities that God has given you to think through situations wisely, shrewdly, ultimately for the glory of God. It's so important. Uh, Number one, we've got a, a great example of what it means to overcome, to walk by faith, and overcome the subtle master of my own will and my own way through Jochebed, Moses' mother. Number two, how do you identify when you are um, succumbing to a subtle master? How do you identify invisible chains when they're there? I'm going to read the next section of verses here, and these are clearly delineated in your text. Okay, look down at verse 11. The storyline is going to shift now to Moses. Verse 11, one day when Moses had grown up, He went out to his people, and he looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and that's a euphemism in Hebrew. You might pay special attention to it. Your text might say something a little bit different. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And this man answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now, if you and I were writing the story of Exodus, neither one of us would have put this this story in here. We wouldn't have done it. And there's a reason why. When you, when you read this story, there are clear, there's a clear opening and there's a clear closing and there's a linking word that brings it all together. In the first part, Exodus chapter 2, especially verse 10, you shall call him Moses because he was drawn from the water. You're going to see more references to being drawn from the water after this section that we just read, kind of towards the end. They function as bookends. And those two thematic words or those, those thematic phrases bring these two sections together. In Exodus 2, 1 through 10, you've got the birth story of Moses. It's how Moses was saved. At the end of this chapter, Exodus 2, 16 through 22, it's the birth story of Gershom and how the Midianite daughters were saved. The linking phrase, again, is is that they are drawn from the water to put those two stories together. But right in the middle of those two birth stories and those stories of deliverance, right in the middle is the failure of Moses to save. Why did the narrator do that? Presumably Moses. Why did he put that in there? Neither one of us would have done that. I believe the writer wanted to do two things. First, there's a very deliberate comparison here between Moses and Jochebed, Moses' mother. Moses' mother trusts the Lord, puts together a plan, executes that plan, still trusting the Lord all of the time, and she's her, her work is, leads to the deliverance of Moses at his birth. Jochebed is a shining example of dependence and trusting in God. Moses, in this section, is an example of independence and trusting in himself. And I want to, I want to flesh that out for you. Uh, Alan Redpath has this statement. I've, I've probably shared it with you before. When God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible person and he crushes them. Have you heard that before? Moses is the impossible person who's been called to do an impossible task. And so he's going to go through a process. Forty years, he's going to go into obscurity, into Midian. And God's going to use that 40 years in an obscure place to show him humility, brokenness, and he's going to crush Moses to show him what it really means to depend on him. Uh, Look back at verse 11 of chapter 2 here. One day when Moses had grown up, He went out. Okay, and you've got to know something about your Old Testament stories to understand what I'm about to tell you here. There are tiny phrases in the Bible that are used over and over again, especially in the Old Testament, when God calls a person to do a specific task. And usually those statements, usually those stories sound something like this. Uh, Genesis chapter 7, God remembered Noah. Genesis chapter 12, God said to Abram, go. Genesis uh, 32, God said to Jacob, God appeared to Jacob in a dream, wrestled with him 
all night long, changes his name to, to Israel, to one who strives with God. There are so many stories, there are so many great people who are called to do significant tasks, and here's the difference. They all start with God and what he calls a person to do. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 doesn't start with God and what God wants to call a person to do. It starts with Moses and what Moses wants to do. None of those callings are indicated here in Exodus, and there's some, pr there's some principles here, because Moses is being overcome by a very subtle master. And the subtle master is, is his own self-initiative, his own self-will, his own desire to do this in his own way. All right, so how do you identify the subtle master of self-will and self-reliance? Number one, here's one thing to consider. God's calling is never self-initiated, and it is never flesh-energized. God's calling is never self-initiated or flesh-energized. Moses might have done the right thing, but it was certainly at the wrong time and in the wrong way. Instead of reading about God's call, what do we read about? Moses' catastrophe of taking this on in his own way. I want you to pay attention to, uh, to the pronouns and to the verbs. Look down at verse 12. Moses, he looked, skip over verse 12, he struck down, verse 13, when he went out, in the middle of verse 13, and he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your command? This is all about Moses and what he is doing. There is nothing about God and what God has called Moses to do in this section. You might be succumbing to the subtle master of self-will and self-reliance if you're not listening to the voice of God and you're listening to the voice of yourself. Number two, you might be succumbing to this subtle master of your own self-will when spiritual ends are achieved by carnal means. Spiritual ends are never achieved by carnal means in the Bible. When Moses takes matters into his own hands on his own terms and in his own ways, he is using his own carnal means to accomplish something that God wants to accomplish in his way without doing those things. Uh, one commentator put it this way. I think this is really good. He says, when God's in it, it flows. When the flesh is in it, it's forced. When God's in it, it flows. When the flesh is in it, it's forced. And that's what's happening with Moses. Number three, spiritual leadership is God-assumed, not self-appointed. Spiritual leadership is God-assumed, not self-appointed. Did you see the euphemism in verse 12? He looked this way and that. Here's what that means. Moses looked around in every direction he could horizontally, but the text never said that he one time looked up vertically. Moses was more concerned about who saw him on the playing field between men and women, and he was less concerned about who saw him who was sitting above in the heavens. The God of all gods who knows all things. Instead of looking around this way and that way, he should have been looking up and hitting his knees and asking God for direction and for what to do. Because he carried out his plan instead of God's plan, everything points to Genesis chapter 3. And the Adamic muscle, the strongest Adamic muscle in our body is the hiding muscle. When we go on our own will and do our own thing in our own ways, we always try to hide what we've done knowing that it is offended in all holy, all knowing, all perfect God in the heavens. We don't see the strong master Pharaoh in this paragraph here as much as the subtle master of our own self-will, our own dependence, our own autonomy, doing things our way when we want to do it. That's what Moses needs to be freed from. That's what Midian is for. And it's going to take 40 years for Moses to learn those lessons. Look down at your text, Exodus chapter 2. Let's, uh, let's finish this, this chapter up, verse 16. Verse 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came and drew water. Seven daughters. Man, oh man, how many? Who's got the most daughters? Condies, you guys got three, right? Two. Two girls. Got four. The Masons, oh my goodness. Y'all got four? You're surviving. You're thriving with your 
It's, hey, man, girls are great. Girls are great. Seven daughters. I got one. Man, love her to death. The priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Reuel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left this man? Call him, that he may eat, eat bread. And Moses was content. I love this phrase in verse 21. We're going to stop as we close and, and just hammer this out a little bit. Moses was content to dwell with the man. Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now, the transition from Moses fleeing to Midian is immediate after he buried the Egyptian in the sand. There's no time has elapsed when we read this in the narrative. It suggests that his flight to Midian is closely associated and closely connected to his failure to save Israel and Egypt. And it also begs us to compare these two stories with one another. I want to compare the action. As you look at the action in, in verses 11 through 15 versus the action in verses 16 through 22, all of the words of Moses in Egypt point to death. All of the action verbs describe, get to, reflect, death, hardship, toil, and end. Moses struck down verse 12. He buried verse 12. He killed verse 14. All the descriptions, all the verbs in Midian point to life. Verse 17, Moses saved the seven daughters. Verse 19, he delivered. Verse 19, again, he drew water. And again, I, I don't want to get into too much details here because of time, but I just want to point out that really small phrase in verse 21. How can it be that one of the most powerful, significant, educated, resourced, gifted, skilled, wise in speech, how could it be that this man now would want to go out into the middle of Midian, nowhere, into obscurity, and to dwell with this man and his seven daughters? Moses was content to dwell with a man. Here in Midian, he chooses to stay with a man that he never met and tend to sheep that he never knew in an obscure place that he might have never been before. And for the next 40 years in the desert of Midian, God's going to do three things in his heart and in his life. Number one, he's going to help Moses develop a servant's heart. In the deserts of Midian, Moses will develop the heart of a servant to do the tasks that nobody else wants to do in conditions that nobody else wants to be in, doing things that nobody else is probably going to remember. Number two, he is willing to be obscure. As opposed to his time in Egypt where everybody probably knew Pharaoh and probably knew Moses, nobody would know Moses in Midian. Nobody would know him in the wilderness and in the desert. Number three, he learns to rest and rely completely on God and nobody else. For 40 years, Moses is going to learn to develop a sovereign's heart, be willing to be obscure, and learn to rest and trust in God and in God alone. The passage in chapter 2 ends in this way. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, verse 23. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out to God for help, and their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. When God heard their groaning, God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Turn to Matthew chapter 2. Let's look at one, one passage in the New Testament before we close. What's really interesting is that throughout Scripture, 
Moses will not be the only liberator and redeemer of God's people. God's going to raise up another liberator and another redeemer to free us, not necessarily from the strong, uh, overt master uh, chains maybe that we see, but from the covert, subtle master, the, uh, the slavery of sin that confines all of us apart from Christ. Matthew chapter 2 talks about this Redeemer, and, and it's interesting the way that it's written. Look at verse 13. Matthew 2, 13, now when they had departed, behold, this is at the, uh, the birth account of Jesus in Matthew's account. When they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, and he said, rise, take the child Jesus and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. You know, there's, there's two kings that try to destroy all the babies. Uh, one of them is Pharaoh and the other one is Herod both for some very similar purposes, um, both because they were wanted control and power, and they wouldn't want anybody else to take that from them. Verse 14, he rose and he took the child and his mother by night, and they departed to Egypt, and he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And it will be out of Egypt that God will call Jesus and his family to come back to Nazareth as uh, Matthew chapter 2 continues. Just as Moses was called and Israel was called out of Egypt, so too this one who is the perfect Israel, the one who fulfilled every area where Israel failed. Jesus was successful and Jesus was obedient. He too will be called out of Egypt. Everything in Exodus chapter 2 is perfectly fulfilled in Jesus in Matthew chapter 2. The slavery that the Israelites are delivered from in Exodus is a bigger picture of slavery that we are delivered from of sin through Jesus Christ. He is our Redeemer. He is our Liberator. Similar circumstances, the Exodus king issued a decree. In Matthew, it's Herod that issues the decree. In Exodus, God protected the Liberator. In Matthew, God protected the Redeemer, Liberator, and true King of Kings. Moses was called out of Egypt to deliver Israel from a very strong master. Jesus was called out of Egypt to deliver us from a very subtle master, the master of sin. And apart from the Holy Spirit's help, we are blind to that sin, which is why we need the gospel preached. This is why we need you guys to go from here, and, and if you do watch those Super Bowl commercials, and if you do see an ad for Jesus, maybe that will lead to a conversation with unbelievers around you. In fact, I want to encourage you, if you're doing that today at the game, if you go on and watch and you see this He Gets Me ad, I want you to ask people about it and just say, like, are you a believer in Jesus? What do you think about that ad? And see where the conversation leads. Maybe, just maybe, God will give you the opportunity to share the gospel through the Super Bowl. Maybe. And if, it, if that happens, I want to hear about it. It would be awesome. As we close, let me give you two points. All right. Number one, God takes pleasure in magnifying the marginalized and honoring the insignificant. God takes pleasure in magnifying the marginalized and honoring the insignificant. Last week we said that it was absolute shocking who was named in Exodus chapter 1. These two women are named. Pharaoh is never, ever named. The trend continues in Exodus chapter 2. Think about this. Moses is the great lawgiver in Israel. Moses was the mediator between God and man. When all the people were at the base of Mount Sinai, they all said, we cannot go up and talk to this God. We cannot meet with him, but you can, Moses. You have to go up for us. This is the man who was given the Ten Commandments from God. When we are introduced to this mighty man in Israel, you read more about his failures than his successes. You read more about his fear than his fortitude. Moses is a man who has changed from the beginning of chapter 2 to the end of chapter 2. There is no doubt about that, but there are a lot of years that transpire in this text. We don't have a whole lot of details about them. Who stands out as the better example to, to imitate? Who's more firm in their faith? Who's more steady in what they're doing in Egypt in Exodus chapter 2? Yet again, another woman, Jochebed. Jochebed is a shining example of faithfulness in a time where Israel could have been extremely faithless. She's a shining example of, of fortitude. 
when everybody else was fearful. She feared the Lord more than she feared Pharaoh and any edict or any law that was passed. And she did what she knew what to, what to do as she walked with God and trusted God. God takes pleasure in magnifying the marginalized and honoring the insignificant. Again, we see this in Exodus. Number two, success is never final and failure is never fatal. Success is never final and failure is never fatal. Uh, Thomas Edison famous, has, has this famous quote, I did not fail, I just found 10,000 ways that did not work. In his great character study on the life of Moses, Chuck Swindoll points out two things that can happen when Christians, as we experience failure in life, because it's not a question of if we will fail, it's just a question of when. We are all very imperfect people, and we will encounter failure on a normal basis. The question is not if you will fail, the question is when and what you are going to do in response to it. Uh, Swindoll talks about two things that Moses should have learned in failure. Number one, experiencing failure promotes an obedient life. Experiencing failure in your Christian life will promote an obedient life. Failure makes you stop. Failure failure forces you to do some introspection, some self-examination. Failure reminds you that you are not perfect. It reminds you that God is God and you are not. God teaches us great lessons through the seasons of failures. Decisions that shouldn't have been made, actions that should have not taken place, words that should not have been spoken. And it's through those failures that God can lead us to a more obedient life, to think more carefully next time, to trust God more, to do the things that honor him instead of doing it our way and on our timing. Experiencing failure prompts an obedient life. It also prompts, number two, Swindoll says, a teachable spirit. It was in the the midst of the Nazi blitzkrieg uh, when Churchill offered one of his best definitions of success. He said, success is moving from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. Success is moving from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. There's there's so much truth to that, not only for for leaders and and principles of practical living, but also especially uh, for Christians in the Christian life. You're going to fail. From time to time, you push through those things. Without a loss of enthusiasm, you keep running after Jesus. You confess those sins, you repent of them, and it forces you to walk closer and closer to God. I wish there was another way. I really do for Moses. I wish he didn't have, I wish he didn't have to go through 40 years in the wilderness. And maybe you're sitting out here and you're thinking, man, the 10 years that I just went through in Tulsa, I wish I didn't have to go through that, but I am so much stronger because of it. Maybe you have your 40 years of Midian somewhere that you can talk about, you could share with somebody else. God is in the business of breaking men and women of independence and increasing our dependence. He is making men by helping them learn dependence and trust on God. Even Paul had his thorn in the flesh. And he found out three times, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Psalm 51, verse 5. Psalm 51, uh, verse 17. There's a great text on failures, sins, and how we respond to them. And it says something like this. A broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. He is always pleased with a broken heart that turns to him instead of to self. So let's learn some lessons from Moses. Let's learn some from Jochebed. Let's keep reading Exodus and see what happens to Israel as this goes on. Let's pray. Father, uh, so many of us here this morning can likely identify with Moses, maybe a little bit too much, uh, speaking for myself. There's been far too many situations where I act too quickly. Um, I think my own thoughts before praying to you and asking for wisdom. I say things too quickly. Lord, I pray that um, all of us here 
we'll see the, the shining example of, of somebody gifted, talented, resourced, educated, strong in every way that you could imagine and still yet not strong enough in Christ, not strong enough in God. Help us to, uh, to see those areas where, where we have failed, where you are teaching us the lifelong lessons of dependence and obedience to you, where we see your grace over and over again that we don't deserve and we could never earn. God, we pray that just as you continue to use Moses to do something incredible for your people, you will continue to use us despite our failures, despite our shortcomings. Give us the humility, give us the longing for a broken heart that loves you and that trusts you more than anything in our marriages, in our families, in our relationships, in our careers, in our workplaces. God, help, um, help brokenness and failure to form us into people who are stronger, um, more quick to prayer, readily dependent on you, no matter what the situation is. And we thank you for the great examples of, of Jochebed. We thank you for the examples of these um, midwife women that stand out in this text. Help us to realize that the insignificant are significant in your eyes. The things that people don't see, that don't know about, you see them, you care about them. Help us to walk faithfully as obedient um, followers of you on a daily basis. We thank you most of all for Jesus, who has forgiven us of, of every sin, Lord, and we have a desire to live for him. We pray that uh, you would draw us closer to him on a daily basis. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray this morning. Amen.